him up. So yeah, my name is Guillaume Duclos. I'm an assistant professor at uh, Brandeis University uh, near Boston. And today I'm gonna talk about self-assembly in active mixtures of microtubules and molecular motors. Okay, so those self-assembled structures that I'm gonna talk about are those asters that you see here on the right um, and where like the motors are labeled in yellow and the microtubules are in cyan. And so that's uh, work that was uh, funded by NSF and the Brandeis Bio-Inspired Mersec, done by my grad student Bibi Najma, who just graduated in collaboration with Aparna Baskin at Brandeis and Peter Foster at uh, USC. All right, so the question I want you guys to keep in mind uh, during this talk is, is it possible to rationally design materials that will mimic some defining features of living organisms? Saying, if I look at a cell, it's very complex. You have a lot of different moving parts that consume energy. But is it possible to isolate some of, you know, like the building blocks that are responsible for those features, let's say, responsible for cell division or like metabolism or cell motility, isolate those uh, building blocks to then be able to reconstruct simple materials that will mimic some of those defining features, okay? Um, and in particular, the building blocks that we're going to talk about are like uh, proteins that consume energy. And so one, um, you know, like great model system uh, to kind of um, extract those proteins from is a cell cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is composed of uh, proteins that from polymers like microtubules and actin. And um, you also have molecular motors that are other types of um, protein that this time can hydrolyze ATP, so extract chemical energy to generate uh, forces, and here step on the microtubule, okay? And so the cytoskeleton really kind of consumes energy at the protein scale to then generate emergent dynamics and structure at the cellular scale or the microscopic scale, okay? So that's the building blocks that we're going to use really like in this, I'm going to talk about in this talk, right? And in particular, I'm going to focus on kinesin motors and microtubules. Okay, and so there've been the, uh, those uh, two proteins that have been like uh, the self-organization of those two proteins has been studied for a while already in the early '90s. You know, that was pioneer work by um, Nederlech and Surrey that showed that if you have stabilized microtubules and clusters of kinase one motors, you create those uh, beautiful asters here on the left. However, you know, like over the past uh, 20 years, there have been a lot of new experiments that show that with very similar types of uh, building blocks, you can have very different types of structures and dynamics. For example, that's work uh, done by uh, Zorni Medagic in early 2000, where you see that if you have the same protein, same building blocks, stabilized microtubules and kinase one clusters, but this time you have a, a small um, depletant, like a PEG molecule now, you have a very different types of organization. You have bundles that are extensile and you can form those beautiful like 2D active pneumatics that you see here, okay? Um, more recently from Harvard in the um, Needleman lab, if you use dynein, which is another type of molecular motor that step on uh, microtubules and microtubules that come from xenopistocyte extract, you see a very different types of uh, dynamics now as the entire like network globally contracts. The scale bar here is like about one millimeter, okay? And even more recently, work again from like uh, Zorimir Dajic lab with kinesin four motors, where this time those are motors that end accumulate uh, on the microtubule and stabilize microtubules, you see also very different types of structure and dynamic that emerge, okay? So that begs the question, is there something, can I, is that something that's like model specific, these types of uh, self-organization, or is it something more universal about it? Meaning like, is it really, does it depend on where the microtubule come from or what motors do I use? Is that why we see all those different types of self-organized pattern or is it something more like generic about it? So that's the question I'd like to address today. Uh, I'm gonna label those two movies here where you see asters are globally contractile as a contractile state. And this, um, those extensile um, bundles here as an extensile state. Okay, and what I want to study is like really the transition, like those two states. Uh, how do we go from a contractile state to an extensile state? So basically, how can the same building blocks trigger different microscopic structure and dynamics? The uh, model system I'm going to use is the one I just introduced. You have microtubules that are stabilized. Uh, they're about one to two micron in length. Um, 
you have a depletant. So here that's peg, those, uh, a small a 20 kilo Dalton peg that induce depletion interaction between the microtubules. So they want to stay aligned together. We have clusters of kinesin motors. So those are multivalent um, clusters that have a lot of motors attached to them. And so therefore they can bind to multiple microtubules at the same time. Those motors hydrolyze ATP. Every time they hydrolyze um, an ATP molecule, they take an eight nanometer step towards the plus end of the microtube. So if you have anti-parallel microtubules, what you end up with is like a, a bundle that will extend its length over time. Okay, so you can see that in this movie from um, Zronimir, where you have two microtubules that are labeled. They come in an anti-parallel fashion. And as a result, because of the stepping of the kinesin clusters, they slide apart from one another, okay? So from like a hydrodynamics perspective, those extensile um, you know, bundles are really like pusher particles that exert dipolar extensile flows. And so now if you have a very dense suspension of those uh, extensile bundles, you see uh, chaotic extensile dynamics, okay? So this movie is really like a prototypical movie of kind of an extensile active fluid. You see the bundles that are continuously elongating, they bend, they buckle, they reform somewhere else. Um, and so this is like, um, you know, like an emergent, like collective flows that's really in a very simple material because now we just have stabilized microtubules, clusters of kinesin one motors, ATP, that's a chemical fuel, and uh, a depletant, the peg. Okay. And so when I started my uh, lab at Brandeis, one kind of goal we had was to study how those emergent flows depend on the um, uh, on the composition of this uh, of the material. And so here I'm showing you now if we systematically increase one component, which is the concentration of motor cluster, you know, like you see very different types of organization again. So at low motor concentration, you recover this extensile phase that's been well characterized by Zvonimir. But now if you start adding more and more motor cluster, you see a, a drastic change in the uh, structure and in the dynamics. Now you start to see local contraction, where basically you form some locally contractile asters in an extensile background. And if I add even more um, motor cluster, then you start to see this globally contractile phase, uh, which is reminiscent of what um, um, I showed in the introduction, where you have dynein and extracts from um, Xenopus. Okay, so that's great because that shows that with the same system, with same components, if I kind of continuously increase the uh, concentration of one of them, I can really go from those different phases that were, you know, like, you know, extensile, acer, and like globally contracted that were initially observed in kind of very different systems. So that tells you that it's not something that's system specific. It's some, there might be some type of generic uh, behaviors at play here. And that's really what I want to study and present in this uh, talk. Okay, so what we've done next was to really um, titrate both the ATP concentration and the motor concentration to try to explore like uh, how these things are organized. So like on the, you see here a phase diagram where on the y-axis is the ATP concentration and on the x-axis that the motor cluster concentration. When I increase the motor concentration, so I go like from left to right, again, I see this extensive to contractile transition. Now, if I increase the ATP concentration, I see the reverse, I see a, a transition from an aster phase to an extensile phase, okay? And if I add more and more ATP, the transition from, ex, uh, to, I need to add even more motors to see a transition from extensile to contractile, okay? Um, if then we do some dual labeling where like both the microtubules and the motor clusters are labeled, we notice that the core of the asters are enriched in molecular motor. Okay, so you can see that maybe better in this uh, quantification here, where we look at each pixel in the movie and kind of measure the, both the intensity of the motor channel and the intensity of the microtubule channel. And you see that in the aster phase, you're enriched in motor cluster. Okay, and so that's been, you know, like enrichment of asters like this has been really a defining feature of. Uh, asters, microtubule based asters. And in particular, this thing has been like well characterized when you have motors that end accumulate on your microtubule. Okay. So, to check if that was the case as well in our experiment, if we had like an accumulated motor, uh, oh, sorry, first of all, and you see as well in this uh, 3D um, 
reconstruction from a confocal microscope as well that the core of the aster, you know, like is enriched in water and the outside layer is not. Okay. Uh, all right. So the next assay we've done is at the uh, high magnification, like a single microtubule assay, where we have isolated microtubules that are stuck on a glass uh, slide uh, that are labeled here in magenta. And we have um, uh, kinesin clusters that are labeled with a different fluorophore, and we can track them and kind of see how they move on the microtubules and how they distribute it on the microtubule. So uh, we we do this really this like multi-scale imaging. So we look at this in a same experimental condition at the bulk level, what type of dynamic and structure we have, and at the single filament level, how are the uh, motors distributed on the microtubules. And so you see here the bulk on the left, and then the image next to it is a, a single filament. Uh, we, we see that when you have an extensile phase at low motor concentration, basically the motors are like uniformly distributed on the microtubule. However, when you have uh, a contractile phase in the bulk uh, at the microscopic scale, if you look at the microscopic scale, you start to see uh, indeed uh, end accumulation of the motor. Okay. So uh, this like bright orange dot here is a motor cap. What is a motor cap? That's basically a lot of motors that are like aggregated together, a lot of clusters that are aggregated together that are like basically stay at the end of the microtubule. Okay. Um, so what, um, what we've done next is try to quantify a little bit more this um, cap formation process. And so we looked at the fraction of microtubules inside our field of view that will have a motor cap. Okay, so that's this P cap uh, number that I'm going to talk about now. We see that the fraction of microtubules with a cap increase when we increase the uh, motor concentration. So we have more and more of our microtubules that have those really rich uh, motor caps. Uh, but when we instead decrease the ATP concentration, then we start that we have we see less and less um, fraction of microtubules that have a motor cap. Okay, so that's kind of consistent with the phase diagram I showed you at the macroscopic scale. When we increase kinesin uh, motor concentration, we see more caps, we see contraction. Or when we increase ATP, we see less cap and we see uh, extensile dynamic. Okay, so. Um, Really, what's happening here at the microscopic scale is that by changing motor concentration and ATP, we're changing the on and off rates of the motor clusters. The on rate is proportional to the motor to the motor concentration. So, if we have more motors we, uh, in solution, we have more motors that will bind to the microtubules, and the off rate uh, is also depend on the ATP concentration. If I have less ATP, I decrease my off rate. And so, what's happening here? And that's work that was really kind of uh, initially described in early 2000 uh, by uh, Joe Howard is that like when you have a very high on rate of uh, motors and a very low off rate and you have highly processive motors, then you can form uh, those um, very dense motor caps at the end of the microtube. Okay, so that's basically what we uh, uh, confirmed here. We see exactly the same type of uh, things happening at the microscopic scale. Okay, so we have a high on rate because we have high motor concentration, low off rate because low ATP. Now, the real question is like, what's happening with the processivity of those clusters? That was really surprising to us that we saw like N accumulating caps because kinesin one motors are not known to be very processive. They're not known to be N accumulating. They, in physiological con um, condition, they maybe take like a hundred steps before they detach. So the processivity is uh, less than a micron, and the, the length of the, our microtubules is between one and two microns here. Okay. However, we're not dealing with like isolated kinesin one motors here. We have clusters of kinesin motors, and that's been known to enhance the processivity of the motors. And so you can see that here. Now, if I quantify the processive, the, the run lengths of those kinesin clusters, you see here in this chemograph that the, the motor works for like at least like four microns and reach the end of the microtubes. And when we do, you know, like uh, when we quantify like a bunch of those events, we see that the run length is between uh, five and six microns. So much larger than the run length of an isolated uh, Kings in one motor. So to really test the role of processivity, we decide to play a little bit with the structure of those clusters. So instead of using 
those uh, multivalent clusters where we don't really control well the valency of the cluster, we use this other construct that was um, developed by um, Linea in uh, the Dodgic Lab. That's a light activable motor, where now instead of having a double headed motor, you have a single headed motor. So that's actually the same protein, just like a shorter version of it, and it doesn't spontaneously dimerize. And so as a result, now you just have single headed motors. And if you shine the blue, blue light, you're going to form just dimers. Okay. And those dimers are like non processive because the single motor heads are non processive. And so we assemble um, you know, like an active uh, gel with this type of motor with the light on without any peg. And that's the movie you see on the left. We don't see, we never see any flows that emerge, any structure. Okay. There is no contraction, there is no extension. It's just like, uh, quiescent. We know that the motors work because if we take the same composition and then we start adding peg, we recover the extensile dynamics that was like, you know, like reported by uh, Lina and Zoninger. Okay. So really here, what we've, and we tested a, a very high motor concentration, very low ATP. We never observe uh, for the formation of asters with those uh, non-processive motors. Um, so, okay, so let me stop here for a second. What are the take home messages so far? We've seen that active mixtures of microtubules and kinesin can self symbol in either an extensile phase or a contractile phase. We've done multi scale imaging at the microscopic and the single filament scale to reveal that an accumulation triggers contraction. And we, we've seen that the binding kinetics and the processivity of the motor clusters is what really controls the acid formation. However, that's not enough to explain, to fully explain the transition from extensile to contractile. Because if we start to increase pneumatic alignment, for example, by adding again more peg, we see the transition from extensile from contractile to extensile phase without impacting how the motors are distributed at the microscopic scale. All right, so you see here, I have peg that induce alignment of my microtubules. And that doesn't, we still have a lot of motor caps, but we have extensile dynamics. So extensile dynamic doesn't, you can still have extensile flows with uh, an accumulated motors. And we've seen that it's very generic. If instead of using PEG to increase the pneumatic alignment of the microtubules, you use a microtubule specific cross linker like PRC1. Now you again enhance the alignment of the microtubules without impacting the end accumulation of the motors. And again, you see extensile flows instead of the contractile asters. So we build again this phase diagram here where you have on the y-axis the peg concentration and on the x-axis the motor concentration. And you see that it's really a competition between the pneumatic alignment and the motor end accumulation that controls the transition from these extensile bundles to contractile asters. And so then we develop, we try to develop, like, and, and it looks like also it's like the phase boundary is linear between those two states. So we developed a simple theoretical model that uh, leverage uh, ideas from self-assembly. So imagine we say the strengths of the aligning interaction between two microtubules come from the depletion interaction. So we can write this, um, you know, like effective uh, potential here that depends on the length of the microtubule, the concentration of PEG, and on the um, concentration of microtubule square, okay? So you're gonna form a bundle, and when you're in a bundle, the soft mode is the sliding, okay? Now, the effective strength of, strength of the end addition interaction depends, again, on the concentration of microtubule square, right, because it's a binary interaction, but also on the concentration of motors that are uh, on, a, on a amount of motors that are on the microtubule that are basically bound to the microtubule in this cap, okay? And so here now, if you have end adhesion interaction, the soft mode is the splay mode, okay? Uh, and then to estimate the, you know, the concentration of motors that are actually bound to the microtubules that are not stepping, we use a, a simple kind of uh, binding uh, kinetic equilibrium. Okay, so when we combine those, uh, those three equations, when we say that the, the phase boundary between the bundle and the aster lays when um, we, um, those effective strengths are like equal, and so that 
gives us this equation, this linear equation for the um, uh, phase boundary in the ATP motor uh, phase space. And so when we fit that equation, we have two fitted parameter, beta over alpha, which is a slope, and KD, which is an intercept. You see that it describes very well the phase diagram that we have here. Okay, and the KD value that we have is also like similar to what's uh, in the literature. Further, we can make, if we use now the fitted parameter from this phase diagram, beta over alpha, we have another, we can make a prediction how in the peg motor phase diagram it will look like. And here I'm just superimposing this uh, prediction onto the experimental data. And you see again, that really captures well uh, the like, um, the phase behaviors of our uh, system. We can push this a little bit further. We can say now that really you have a single control parameter, beta over alpha, that really uh, dictates the organization of the um, of this system. Uh, this control parameter is uh, set by the ratio of the different component concentration. Okay, and that comes from like the self assembly model. So what we've done, we 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 know exactly what is the composition of our system. So we can measure this ratio, and we can look. In all the experiments we've done, we have maybe 300 like uh, independent experiments. What was the probability of being in a globally contractile phase or in the aster phase? So we combine those things together to tell us that what is the probability of being like contractile. And we can look also what was the fraction of our experiments depending on this ratio that was in the extensile phase. Okay. And again, you see that you have this very, uh, the, well, you have the equiprobability here, this 32 micromotor number, you know, it doesn't mean much, but like the point is that like, it really, um, you know, like delimitates the contractile phase from the extensile phase, okay? And um, it also like uh, aligns very well with like the beta over alpha parameter that we fitted from the, um, from the first phase diagram. So, so here, what we see is that really the self-assembly motor captures the aster to bundle transition. So you see now, I'm not talking about the dynamics anymore. I'm not talking about extensile or contractile. I'm talking about asters and bundles. And really a conclusion here is that once you have an aster, you're going to be contractile. And once you have a bundle, you're going to be extensile because of those uh, soft modes that are exist in the system. We can push this a little bit further because now we can actually make a prediction about how PEG and PRC1 impacts the transition. Um, when you have PEG, when you have depletant, you know, like the PEG doesn't need to bind to the microtubule. So as a result, the, uh, that's the same equation I showed you earlier for the alignment interaction. It depends linearly on PEG and quadratically on the concentration of microtubule, uh, on, the, on the concentration of microtubules. Now, however, if we looked at PRC1 now, this microtubule specific cross linker, to create a bundle, the PSC1 needs to bind to the microtubule. So as a result, it's not going to depend quadratically on the microtubule concentration anymore. It's going to depend linearly on the microtubule concentration. And so if we can make predictions now about how this um, the phase boundary will depend on the microtubule concentration. And you see for like a peg-based active gel, it's going to depend linearly on the microtubule concentration. However, for a PRC1 based active gel, this transition now is independent on the um, number density of microtubule. So that's a prediction that we can now test experimentally. We assemble like pace based active gels and we consistently increase the microtubule concentration without changing anything else. And you see that we have a transition from contractile to extensile phase that's happened between like 2.6 and 3.3 mix per mil. If now we do the same experiment with PRC1 based active gel, we've seen that the transition is independent on the microtubule number density. Right? So we change from one mix per mil to 10 mix per mil. And we, we always, and if we start from a contractile state, you, in that range at least, you always stay in the contractile uh, region. Um, so that was very nice that confirmed that really like this self assembly approach can really like differentiate between what's happening in a peg based active gel or like a PRC1 based active gel. All right, so the take home message uh, conclusion, the new one that we've seen is that, is that the aligning interaction between the microtubules will compete with the N accumulation to promote the formation of extensile bundle. So it's not enough to just look at um, 
the how the models are distributed on the market tubules, you also need to think about how do they align with each other. Okay, and we were able to do that because we looked at this like multi scale imaging, both at the bulk level and at the microscopic level. And I think the most important take home message here is that this very simple self assembly model can capture as well this transition from like acid to bundle by using, you know, like considering the kinetics of the microscopic interaction between the motor clusters and the microtubules, we can predict what self assembled structure will emerge. And it's those structures that then will, so we don't need to know anything about the dynamics. And then that those structures that will lead to either contractile or extensile dynamics. Okay, so I'm, uh, so that's my conclusion. I want to thank my uh, lab mates here, uh, funding from NSF. I want to thank, thank our collaborators, Peter Foster and a partner at Bascon. And finally, I want to thank the Brandeis Bioinspire Mersic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Guillaume, for a wonderful talk. We have time for a few questions. Uh, I don't see anything written in the chat. Nancy, uh, raise your hand. Nancy, please go ahead and ask your question. Sorry, that was a, a very nice talk. Uh, let's see if I can get my video on I'm in the dark. Ah, anyway, um, yeah, I was just curious a little bit more about the role of the clustering. So you showed that with the clustering, um, yes. So yeah, it was important. You showed that with dimers, you got different effects. But it, do you think there's a rich space there, or it's more of a kind of a binary uh, con level control? Uh, yes. So I. So no, definitely. Right. The processivity is going to control uh, if the motors will be able to end accumulate or not. So it's going to be between. You need to think about processivity and the length of the microtubule. So it's really the comparison between those two length scale that's going to tell you, are you going to end accumulate or not? And the processivity depends on the valency of the clusters. So we have valences, we have clusters that have also like uh, a more well-defined like valency. And we see that they're still like processive, but we need to have a very a much higher K on to kind of have contraction. So you can play there a little bit. And I think that's like one takeaway here again is like, you know, like we never really thought much about like the structure of those clusters, but like what we finding here is that it's actually very important to kind of understand the, how they self-assemble uh, at the microscopic scale. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy. I see Ricard also has his hand raised. Ricard, please go ahead and, and ask your question. Hi, um, thanks Guillaume for the talk, very, very nice. Um, I, I wanted to ask about when you write this energy of alignment in the case of uh, cross-linkers, yeah. I didn't get how you go from a scaling of uh, raw squares to just raw. So, because I understand that it's proportional to the concentration of cross-linkers, but they still cross-link two microtubules, right? So how do you get rid of that square? So they need to, the, the cross linker needs to bind to the microtubule. So what's important is not just the, the total concentration of microtubule, that's the concentration of micro, of sorry of motor of cross linker. That's a cross concentration of cross linker per microtubule. And actually, this this cross linker is a, like a dimer. So maybe that will answer your question. Yeah, like yeah, they form like dimer. So you have yeah, mm. that like. No, I, I don't fully get it yet. So I, I would I would say you have the concentration of available crosslinkers, right? This is this uh, PRC one. Yeah. And then they crosslink two microtubules, so hence the row square. But then why do you have the one over row? Oh, because you want to know how much PRC one you have on the on the microtubule. Right. You need the, the get one needs to bind to the microtubule to generate this crosslinker. I see. So it gets distributed over all the microtubules and you want to know how much of it is on the microtubule. Yes. Well, that, see, that's, the, that's the difference with the peg. Uh, the peg doesn't need to bind to the microtubule. And so that's why you just need to consider the solution, the concentration of peg in solution, not the concentration of peg on the microtubule. Well, here yes. there's a concentration of cross on the microtubule. Okay, yeah, that's clear now, thanks. Thank you, Ricard. Uh, 
So I had a very quick question for you, Guillaume. So, yeah. and my question was more about not the aster to uh, uh, extine side to contractile, but more from the local contraction to the global contraction phase. Yes, yes. So does that just depend on the concentration of motors or does that also depend on whether you're more likely to have bundles versus these aster kind of structures? Yes, yeah, so um, I think it's a very different types of uh, transition. It's maybe more like a percolation transition because okay. what we've seen and, uh, is that like if you have a very thin sample, you get small, you get aster that are far away from each other. But then if you start to kind of increase the height of your aster, right. now you can kind of connect not just in 2D, but also in 3D. And these things now form like a globally contractile uh, right. phase. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so neither the bundle nor the aster, you want a more well connected percolating kind of structure. As, as, uh, that's my. Uh, yeah, I, I think that also makes sense. I see another hand raised, but in the interest of time, we have to move on to Zeb's talk. And John, we can take your question for uh, Guillaume, you know, at the end of both talks. So once again, Guillaume, thanks a lot for a wonderful talk. Uh, yeah. And we'll take more questions for you, you know, at the end of, uh, you know, both talks. And uh, I'll, I'll clap on behalf of everybody. 